So we just discovered a magic equation that when it's true at every crossing in a knot diagram, then that knot has a tricoloration. And if it's violated at even one of the crossings in that knot, then we do not have a tricoloration for that knot. And that magic equation, as we've just seen, can be used to build a system of equations that can tell us whether or not a knot has tricolorations at all, or whether maybe all of its tricolorations might happen to be trivial. What we want to do is see now a brute force example of how we could put this into practice computationally to determine whether the knot represented by a more complicated diagram has a tricoloration or does not have a tricoloration. And if it does have a tricoloration, how many tricolorations does it have? These are the kinds of questions which hopefully we're going to be able to use to distinguish between knots at the end of the day. If we can learn enough about the colorability of a knot, then we should hopefully know enough about that knot to distinguish it from all other knots in the universe. So in our previous video, we saw that the figure 8 knot was not tricolorable, at least not in any interesting way. Because when we built a system of four equations, four modular equations, mod 3, uh, using the magic equation at each of the four crossings of this diagram, we got a 4x4 four four system that has solutions, but all of its solutions were trivial. And the reason they were trivial is that there was only one free variable in them. As soon as I chose one of the colors for one of the arcs, it dictated to me what all the other colors in that diagram had to be. And specifically, it dictated that they all had to be equal. So the figure eight knot was not interesting from the point of view of tricolorability. Let's look at an example that is interesting in view of tricolorations. So what we want is to build a system of equations for a more complicated knot. Every solution of that system of equations, using the magic equation to build it up, uh, is going to give me a valid tricolorability. But we want to know whether or not those colorations actually use all three of the colors, 0, 1, and 2. So here's a more interesting knot. This is the knot which is called in the old-fashioned notation 8 sub 18. So in its, in its lowest terms projection, as we're seeing here, it has eight crossings. So when we build a system of equations for this particular uh, knot's tricolorability, we're going to expect it to have eight unknowns, each of the unknowns being a color of one of the eight arcs in this diagram. So let's label the arcs x1 up through x8. Uh, and abusively, we're also going to call those the colors 0, 1, or 2. And there are eight crossings, which I'm going to label A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. And at each one of those eight crossings, we're going to have the magic equation that's determined by the three arcs, the colors of the three arcs, that are incident at that crossing. So all we have to do is go one crossing at a time and write out the magic equation that has to be satisfied at that crossing in order for that crossing to meet our tricolorability condition. At crossing A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H, the magic equation, the right-hand side, is all going to be 0. Remember, the magic equation is x plus y plus z is congruent to 0, mod 3. And so all we have to do at each of the crossings is figure out which, uh, which are the three arcs that are incident at that crossing. For example, at crossing A, uh, x1 is my overstrand, x6 and x7 are my understrands, and so the sum that I need to make at crossing A is x1 plus x6 plus, plus x7. And if I do that same thing at crossing B, 1, 2, and 4, C, 2, 7, and 8, D, 2, 3, and 5, E, 3, 4, and 6, F, 4, 5, and 7, G, 5, 6, and 8, and H, 1, 3, and 8, now I have the magic equation expressed at each one of the eight crossings in this knot diagram. You might want to pause the video and, and check my work on that, but I think I, I, think I have this right. Um, so we have now an 8 by 8 system of linear equations that we want to solve over Z mod 3. Right. We want to find a solution where x1 through x8 are all numbers, residues, in uh, either 0, 1, or 2, mod 3. So the system that we get, if we use linear algebra to just determine a matrix, maybe an augmented matrix, which is going to give me the solution for this system if we were to row reduce it, uh, we're going to get this 8 by 8 system. Well, what you'll notice is that on each one of these rows, um, three of the entries are 1, and all the other entries are 0. So at least if we're going to do the row reduction on this by hand, which I don't recommend, but it's good to do it once or twice just to get a feel for it. If we do this row reduction by hand, at least we should be helped by the fact that a lot of the entries in each of these rows are 0. And if we then augment the right-hand side of this matrix with zeros, we could then, you can imagine, row reduce this thing over Z mod 3 and come up with the solution. 
Let's actually use technology for this, rather than pencil and paper, because uh, it's a good opportunity to uh, get an introduction to using Sage. So the easiest way to use Sage, if you're just going to do a, just use it for a simple calculation, uh, is just to open up uh, sagemath.org and open up a Sage cell. The easiest way is just to go to this web address, sagecell.sagemath.org. And I'm using Sage here because, first of all, it's open source, so anyone can just jump into this browser and, and use this very powerful computational algebra engine. Um, and second of all, it has the capability to do linear algebra over uh, a modular arithmetic ring. For example, we have to do this linear algebra over Z mod 3. Uh, and since it's not maybe a familiar process to do, we might not have all that arithmetic off the top of our heads, um, using this technology is really a great way to go. Plus, we have an 8x8 system, so it's going to be a lot of work, whichever way you slice it. So I'm just going to tell Sage uh, that I want to create a space of matrices called M, uh, in which the elements of those matrices are elements of the integer ring mod 3. So this is the uh, notation that we use for that. And the matrices that we're going to use in this ring are going to be 8 rows, 8 columns. I'm going to leave off the augmented column of zeros here because we know what's going to happen with those when we row reduce. Then I just have to tell it what my matrix is. So this is where all the hard work goes in. We actually have to type in uh, the, the rows of the matrix uh, to build this matrix that I'm going to call A. Uh, and then I'll ask Sage to print out what A looks like just to make sure that I check my work. And when I do that, uh, it spits out this matrix. So this is the one that I had on the previous slide, the one that we need to row reduce in order to figure out if we know it's row echelon form, we'll know how many free variables there are. And if we know how many free variables there are, we'll know how many choices that we can make for colors of arcs in this diagram that dictate what the colors of all the other arcs would then have to be. And so the magic uh, thing to ask Sage to do is to report out the echelon underscore form the reduced row echelon form for this matrix. And because we've created this matrix in a space of matrices over Z mod 3, Sage is going to do the arithmetic over Z mod 3 as well. And so when I ask Sage for the echelon form of this matrix, it gives me this right here. And so this is, if we reduce this matrix completely into its uh, reduced row echelon form, that's what it looks like. Now what's important about this matrix is that there are three rows that are completely zero. That means that there are three columns in this matrix which don't have pivots. And those are the columns which correspond to free variables. So what we find out is that for this 8x8 system, there are a total of three free variables. And that means that we get three independent choices of how to color three arcs in this knot diagram. And those three choices then determine the colors of all the rest of the arcs. So we have a lot more freedom. And that's actually a good thing. We want there to be a lot of solutions so that we have a whole bunch of different colorations. So let's go back and take stock of how many different colorations there are as a result of having these three variables in the solution for this linear system. So the three variables that we, we found could be free variables. The ones that are not in pivot columns are the last three. So there are three free variables, x6, x7, and x8. So what that means is, if I decide independently how to color this arc, this arc, and that arc, so these three arcs, if I choose the colors of these three arcs independently, from 0, 1, and 2, then those three colors are going to then determine the colors of all five of the other arcs in this diagram. Those are the pivot columns, the bound variables. So what does this mean about how many colorations that we have? Because each of the choices that we get to make for x6, x7, and x8 are all independent of one another. So how I choose one of them doesn't have any bearing on how I have to choose the others. And for each one of them, I have three different colors I can choose, 0, 1, and 2. Working out the combinatorics of that, um, we therefore have 3 times 3 times 3 different ways to independently choose the colors of those three arcs. So in principle, there are 27 different ways that I can quote unquote try color, that I can come up with a valid coloration uh, that meets our tricolorability conditions at each of the eight crossings. So that seems like it's a lot, right? Um, the issue, though, so that's 3 to the n, right? Every free variable that I have gives me an independent choice of three different colors. And since they're independent, we just multiply all of those together. Uh, and so 3 to the n try colorations if I have n free variables. But again, not every one of those tricolorations is going to be an interesting one. What we'd like to know is how many of them are trivial and how many of them are not trivial. Well, we already know that three of them are going to be trivial. Those are going to be the ones where I choose x6, x7, and x8 to all be the same. So I color all three of these 0, or I color all three of them 1, or I color all three of them 2. Each of those is then going to give me a trivial coloration. So I'm going to subtract those away. And I therefore have 24 
colorations which are non-trivial. Since we know that two colorations are not a thing, anything which is not using only one color has to be using all three. And therefore, I have 24 non-trivial tricolorations for this particular knot. But they're not all fundamentally different, because if I choose to call 0, 1, and 2 some other permutation, so if maybe 0 is green and 1 is red and 2 is blue, so I just permute 0, 1, and 2 in some ways, I'm going to get a different tricoloration, but it still has the same sort of tricolorability properties. I'm just sort of relabeling the, the names of the colors. Um, and so if I want to, I can quotient out by that, right? and quotient out by the number of permutations that I could perform on this set, which is going to give me uh, sort of colorations that are all the same. If I quotient out by that, I'm going to figure out how many essentially different choices of colorations that I have. And since there are three factorial, or six, different ways to permute 0, 1, and 2, and each of those permutations is going to give me the same tricoloration up to a relabeling of the colors, then what I can do is divide this 24 by that 6, by that 3 factorial, to find out that really there are four fundamentally distinct ways of tricoloring this knot, 818. Right? Four different ways in which I can choose x6, x7, and x8. I can choose the colors of these three arcs in four fundamentally different ways, and they're going to give me fundamentally different tricolorations that use all three colors for this knot diagram. So this gives us a lot of information about this knot. Uh, what we want to do next is figure out how to push that envelope a little bit further. And in cases where using only three colors might not be enough, how do we go from three colors to more than three colors? What do we have to throw away? And what about this process remains the same?